Hello, everyone. Welcome. I want to welcome everyone who's coming in um, to be with us in person and those of you who are joining us from all over the world um, online. Um, I'm Ellen Moody. I'm an associate project specialist in the collections department at the Getty Conservation Institute, or the GCI. Um, and I'd like to start our program today acknowledging the Getty's presence on the traditional, ancestral, unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. The Getty recognizes and is committed to undertaking the work to build relationships with these communities. I would also like to acknowledge that today is the High Holy Day of Yom Kippur, which prevents many from joining us live. A tight scheduling window made this unavoidable, but we hope that those who can't be with us today will watch the recording of this event on the GCI's YouTube channel. Today, we celebrate Fred Eversley and the release of Fred Eversley, The Shape of Energy. I thought I'd start by giving you some background on the film. Um, it's the most recent edition of our Artist Dialogue series, a cornerstone of the GCI's modern and contemporary art initiative which was developed to address the unique and urgent challenges that recent art brings to its own conservation. And this isn't just because the materials in contemporary art are especially, well, infinitely varied and often short-lived, but it's also because the question of just what about an artwork that you need to preserve or is most significant to preserve is a tricky question to answer. One important way to approach this question is by asking the artist, and conservators of contemporary art often use the artist interview to help guide their treatments. While these interviews can produce great insight into artistic intent, a transcript does not show us the artist's process. Seeing the artist at work can provide all kinds of information that is just missing from a verbal description. Moreover, these interviews tend to take place in museums and private collections, and often end up inaccessible to the larger conservation community, let alone the public. The Artist Dialogue series brings some of this material into the light with each short video featuring both the artist's voice and the artist at work. To date, we have completed nine films, all available to watch on our website. Um, we also have two in production. Unedited interview transcripts are also available upon request. The artists featured in this project are all local to LA, or as in Fred's case, were local to LA when the interview took place, and form part of the GCI's Art in LA project. We knew we needed to include Fred Eversley in this series, not only because he was a pioneer of the light and space movement in LA, but also because of his background in engineering, which gives him a unique and groundbreaking approach to art making. The film we're about to watch contains some biographical information, so I'll be brief in my introduction. Born in Brooklyn in 1941, the son of an aerospace engineer, Fred Eversley had a facility with both art and technology from childhood, using his grandfather's darkroom to experiment with photography and getting his amateur radio license at age seven. He still knows the call numbers, he has them memorized. He went on to get a degree at, in electrical engineering from Carnegie Mellon University, before moving to California for a job in aerospace. Lucky for us, he soon left engineering to become a full-time artist. Over five decades, in his studio in Venice, he created a body of sculpture largely in polyester that plays off of the parabolic shapes he encountered in radar, in radar systems from his early engineering days. His work, including several large-scale commissions, is in dozens of international collections and has been shown in hundreds of exhibitions worldwide. Anyone who has seen images of his sculpture will know how beautiful they are, but you really need to experience them in person to appreciate the depth and saturation of their colors and how they distort the space around them and how that distortion changes depending on where you are in the room. In just a few days, you'll have the chance to see Fred's work in person at the Orange County Museum of Art which is reopening with the retrospective Fred Eversley reflecting back on the world. This um, retrospective covers three decades of his career and opens to the public this Saturday, October 8th, and runs through January 15th. Don't miss it. After the film, Fred will sit down for a conversation with Rochelle Ravenk, the head of conservation and preservation at the Getty Research Institute. 
Before she left to head up the GRI labs, she was leading the Art in LA project here at the GCI and initiated the Artist Dialogue series. She's now passed the bat that baton on to me, a project I'm quite excited to take on, but Rochelle is a very had hard act to follow. Um, among her many accomplishments, which she forbade me to list since it would take a while, Rochelle authored the book Made in Los Angeles, Materials, Processes, and the Birth of West Coast Minimalism, a must read for anyone interested in the art coming out of LA in the 1960s. After the conversation, there will be time for audience Q&A, both virtual and in person. Um, and now I'll pass it off to my colleagues in AV to start the film. Um, please silence your cell phones. Thank you. The genesis of my work is energy. Energy being the sole contributor for all life on Earth. Without energy, none of this exists. Especially living here in Venice Beach all of these years, where you're surrounded by the ocean and the sun and the wind, you became even more aware of how the natural energy around makes people very, very happy. There are very few fights on the beach. You know, people are too busy absorbing energy to fight. I'm a sculptor. Most of my sculpture is done in polyester. The reason I use polyester is that it is the only clear liquid material that I can shape into parabolic shapes. The parabola being the perfect concentrator of all forms of energy. I went to Brooklyn Technical High School in electrical engineering, and then on to Carnegie Mellon. And during the summers, I worked as a radar systems technology uh, repairman. All radar reflectors are parabolic. So I was surrounded literally by parabolas. When I graduated from Carnegie Mellon, I joined Wiley Laboratories in El Segundo. Wiley brought me out here to basically handle special projects. We became very much part of the Venice community. All the artists were just starting to move into Venice. We had to get up every morning at eight o'clock, put on a tie and jacket and go to El Segundo. But in the evening, we came back to Venice and hung out with the local crowd. And that's where I got really introduced to my generation of artists. Dwayne Valentine, Larry Bell, John McCracken, Peter Alexander. They all had studios within three blocks of here. While I was an engineer, I became the first artist to sign up to be a technology advisor to Charles Maddox, uh, three doors down the street. He had just formed an organization called the Aesthetic Research Center, AER. And that was sort of the situation when I had my accident and almost died after I hit the uh, telephone pole with my car. And I took that opportunity to retire from engineering and become an artist. I used Charlie's lathe to cast basically three color, three layer pipes that I polished the inside and outside and then truncated them into interesting shapes. The parabola is a geometric shape. It's a very special geometric shape. It's the only geometric shape that concentrates all forms of energy to a single focal point. Unfortunately, the only easy way to create a parabola is by rotating a liquid about the vertical axis. That means the slope of the piece as you go around the, the, the shape constantly changes, which means it's impossible to machine hand polish because you can't make a tool to machine polish it the way you can a spherical shape or, or a flat shape. Perfect parabolic shapes like my pieces or telescope mirrors are hand polished. The pieces start out with clear polyester, which is a viscous, clear material that smells a lot. And the fumes are noxious, so you have to wear a respirator. 
I mix in a certain number of drops of each color, whatever the color to be, and then I put them into the machine that is a modified potter's wheel, so you can control the speed of it. And I set the speed for the shape I want, pour the plastic in. If I'm going to do multiple layer pieces, I pour the plastic in and wait until the first piece gets to a certain state of hardness, but not totally hard, and then put in the second batch of colored plastic, and so forth and so on. And then you let it rotate until it gets hard. You take it out of the mold and then begins the majority of the work, about 16 or 17 steps of sanding and polishing, starting with incredibly rough generally 36 grit sandpaper, and then going down to the very finest you can buy, which is about 36,000 grit sandpaper, and then two or three roughnesses of polishing compound to get to the very finest polishing compound, and then put a good coat of wax on top of the whole thing. 95% of the work is in the sanding and polishing it's an incredible amount of dog work. Uh, there's nothing uh, very satisfying about it. It's necessary dog work to get to the end result, which is a highly transparent, optically perfect surface. Then it's done, and it's either great, good, or bad. Sometimes you have an accident where the colors are pouring in too fast, and the colors start blending into each other. Sometimes you have some air bubbles, Sometimes they're close to the surface and you can sand them out. And sometimes they're too far in. And if it interferes with the overall effect of the piece, then you throw that piece away. But the advantage is no one else that I know in the art world does it because it's too damn much work. I'm unique in that way, at least I think I am, because I developed techniques that are very labor intensive perfectly hand polishing parabolas without altering its shape. I do most of the work myself. I've done some pieces in bronze in where I had a foundry in Spain that was crazy enough to try centrifugally casting in bronze. It works. But most of my work has been done in this studio, virtually all of it in this studio, in polyester. My first color that I used was really arbitrary. The first set of colors were colors that Charles Maddox had in his studio. And then when I started consciously using colors, I used the same three colors for all of my three color pieces, basically violet, amber, and blue. They're totally arbitrary colors, but I like the effect they created. And so I continue using them for the, as long as I was doing three color pieces. In 1972, I went next door to McCracken's studio, and he gave me his can of black pigment, and that's how I ended up starting making opaque black pieces as opposed to transparent three-color pieces. And I made a series of white pieces, each one different from each other, because white's a funny color. In polyester, in a parabolic shape, actually in thin sections turns pink. It's not so much the pigment, but the refraction of the light affecting the pigment. Hastings Plastics sold two kinds of casting resins in those days. One was made by Silmar Chemical, which is a small company in Gardena, and that ended up being named Fred Eversley Resin. The other one was made by 3M Corporation, and it was called Mass Cast Resin for casting large pieces. I used a particular plastic that is the most stable that I know of, it's uh, more difficult to cast it without cracking, but it has much more superior qualities of not changing. I've used that plastic uh, for virtually all of my work. 
The only conservation issue you have is if somehow they get scratched or chipped or something like that. If you have a big chip, rather than alter the shape of the whole piece, it's better to cast in very carefully. You have to match the color very carefully because the final color can change during hardening. So you have to actually do these experiments, figure out exactly the formula. My earliest pieces haven't changed one iota since they were made. The color's stable, the plastic's stable. 99% of my pieces have never been conserved. Most contemporary painting certainly will not last thousands of years. That much of an engineer I am, right? I watch a lot of my friends' paintings being conserved after 20 years. So in terms of uh, comparables, I feel I'm operating with as secure a material as can be. Most of my pieces that have been bought by collectors stay in the same collection forever. People move them around the house and look at them from different angles and perspectives, day, night, artificial light, natural light. And the kids grew up looking at the pieces and several of the kids come back and buy pieces when they get rich enough. So I have several multi-generational collections. And so as far as I'm concerned, I've achieved more than I set out to do. All right. Hi, Fred. It's the first time I've seen it myself. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. I'm, I don't tell me you didn't like it because I think it's too late now. <laughs> Uh, oh yeah, we have to hold the microphone closer. Um, I'm so happy to see this movie finished. Um, I think it, we started it in 2017, 2018, so that was a while in the making. Um, and I'm so happy to have this conversation with Fred, um, who's an artist and a person that, um, for whom I have immense admiration and affection. And I think I'm not the only one, judging by the number of people who are in this audience, um, collectors, friends, um, Carnegie Mellon alumni. <laughs> so um, I feel very fortunate to be here with Fred. Um, Fred's art is so rich and his life is so fascinating that we're gonna barely have the time to scratch the, the surface in this conversation today. Um, but I'm gonna uh, start by asking Fred some questions and then after a while I'll, I'll open it to the audience. And audience on Zoom, um, you can start putting your question in the chat and then of course in person I will um, invite everyone to ask questions once we're done. So my first question is a very broad question, but what made you want to change from engineer to artist? Was that something that was long in the making or that was very sudden? Can you tell us a bit about that? No, I mean, basically, uh, I had the opportunity of, A, having an income coming in, a uh, disability for a year, B, staying out of the army, uh, and so I could do something uh, totally uh, to my liking. And so I started trying to make art. Uh, I was already uh, assisting Charlie Maddox and, and several other artists, Larry Bell, some other people, with technical details of what they were trying to do. And so I uh, started playing around uh, myself and uh, evolved into a career. <laughs> what can I say? And Fred, when you say disability, that was when you had your accident that you referred to. I was on crutches right? for a year. And uh, the one thing I could do was just sit in a stool or stand in the corner and cast and polish, which is what I did. Is I think I know that 
when you were quite young, you started casting these um, jello lenses. So that's something that somehow was there even before. Can you talk about that? A yeah, bit? I mean, this happened when I was something, I don't know, 12 or 13 years old. There was an article in Popular Mechanics magazine about uh, them using, uh, centrifugally casting uh, glass mirrors and even more so before glass, using mercury mirrors in telescopes to, uh, uh, for, uh, for astronomers. And basically, if you rotate any liquid, it forms a perfect parabola, which is the shape that focuses all energies to a single focal point. And if that liquid happens to be mercury, it's a perfect reflector and it makes a perfect reflector for a telescope. The only trouble was is that mercury vapors are extremely poisonous. So virtually all of those early people died of, uh, uh, and so they stopped doing it. Uh, and what I simply did was to take that little bit of knowledge I had from the article and go down to my father's basement and put, uh, rotate a pie pan of water on a phonographic turntable and create a, a parabola uh, that focused light like uh, a reflector does. And a jello uh, hardens. So, I mean, you end up with something that's not a, not a perfect mirror, but uh, something that is a reasonable mirror uh, and a reasonable lens, depending on you know how how you use the jello and such, and I did that probably on and off. I mean, not every day, but you know, I played around for I guess my senior year of, of high school for sure, and then when I went off to college, I studied engineering and. and uh, got my degree in electrical engineering. And so what I did when I started making art was just to apply the same rotating a liquid about the vertical axis. Uh, and I used polyester as a liquid that happens to harden with the addition of a catalyst. And it came out with fresh little pieces. And the experiment worked and I went larger and larger my largest piece is eight feet in diameter, and that the turntable I used for that was the turntables that were used for machining the atomic bombs that fell in Japan in 1945. Uh, I own them both, and they're in storage right now, and I, I go to see them on Friday. They're in the valley in storage. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever use them again, but I mean, that's, what I used, and the way I used them was that I'm sure most people in the room are familiar with Gemini, the lithography house. Well, the guy who founded Gemini and the money behind Gemini was Stanley Greenstein, uh, who happens to be one of my fraternity brothers. Different schools, same fraternity. And so, when I found these two turntables uh, at auction for $50 each, and they probably cost the government $10,000 in 1945 or 1942, uh, uh, he sent a truck and a forklift and such, and we took them to his factory, and I rebuilt them in his factory, and then he literally took his truck and, and forklift and brought them out to my studio and installed them in my studio and I used them for 50 years. And they're now in storage in the valley and I go on Friday to look at them and see if I ever do, I'm gonna use them again. But, uh, uh, so I mean, it, 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 both Sid Felsen and Stan Greenstein, the two partners of Gemini, uh, happened to be uh, my fraternity brothers, and uh, that worked out just perfectly. Um, Fred, I wonder, 
have your permission to interrupt you, so I'm going to no, <laughs> jump no, no. in. I just wonder if this um, experimental approach that you had at 12 years old and that you had as, a, an, as an engineer is the same approach that you brought. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Um, I wonder if this experimental approach that you had at 12 years old is what prompted you to become an engineer and eventually also that approach that you took to being an artist. I mean, we see you taking notes, uh, recording your experiments. Um, I know you had failures sometimes that you used to um, do better and that sometimes you don't consider failures at all. So do you think that this experimental approach is like a, a hallmark of um, who you are as an artist? Well, yes. In other words, uh, you learn from, from each experiment, from each attempted testing, you learn something. Uh, that you then uh, incorporate in future castings. Uh, a lot of it's accidental. I mean, you don't know how things are going to work. Uh, certainly, in terms of the optics of a parabola, uh, you can sit and try to figure it out mathematically, but it's quicker just to go and make the experiment and see how it works. Uh, how colors interact with each other, how multiple layers of colors interact, how uh, the thickness of each layer changes things. Uh, it is somewhat of a, even all these years later, it's somewhat of a surprise. Uh, and uh, some of my best, very best pieces have come out completely as a surprise. Uh, the one piece, the biggest piece in this show in, uh, in Orange County right now uh, was an accident in a way, uh, the way the colors blended. Uh, it's a large 40-inch piece. Uh, I showed it at the Whitney Museum in 1972 and sold it to a collector in Connecticut and took it to his house and installed it. And uh, he died many, many years ago and his son inherited it and brought it to Santa Barbara. And uh, there it is. And uh, it got damaged on, in the transit to the, uh, to the museum. My sister and Tony over there uh, managed to repolish it for the third time. Uh, it's better now than it's ever been ever. Uh, and it's a little different now because the proportions are more, are better by accident. Uh, and so that, you know, that's just one example that is very recent. I mean, this happened only four days ago. So, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, believe me. Uh, and uh, uh, so he fixed it and then his mother drove us up here. So. Uh, <laughs> The, uh, you know, I mean, his family, Tony's been working for me since he's been 14 or 13. So, you know, I mean, and now he's. That definitely deserves an applause. Um, is, is it possible to have the other PowerPoint? Since we're on the topic of experiments, um, Fred, I wanted to show some of your um, pieces and discuss a little bit your approach to color and okay. experimenting with color. I, I don't know, is, can I, if I do this, will I, oh, there you go. Okay, so I wanna show, so this is one of your early pieces, right, from 1969, yes. and we see these um, three colors, right, mostly three colors, even. Right. Um, and then this is some of your more recent color combination, and I mean, look at this, it's just like amazing. Actually, when you talked about jello, it reminded me that maybe that's why your pieces look so edible <laughs> to this day. But can you talk a little bit about your approach to color and your, how it's evolved over the years and how you experiment with it? Yes, I mean, basically, for most of my career, I use uh, the same four or five bottles of color, you know, in various proportions, violet, amber, and blue in various proportions, uh, combined with uh, black pigment, white pigment, and gray pigment, uh, that for all those years. And then when I was forced to move to, back to New York, 
all my colors were in California in storage. And so I had to go out and buy brand new colors. And so I had to start experimenting with a whole new vocabulary of colors, including some colors that are fluorescent colors, or iridescent colors. And uh, so my newest pieces, uh, yeah, like the piece on the right, uh, is a, it's a two color piece. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a very iridescent kind of uh, pink and, uh, and orange, I guess it is. And uh, uh, it's more because, it's simply because I had to come up with new colors. I, I, the old colors were stuck in California. Most of my old studio is still, we go see it tomorrow, believe it or not. It's in, uh, in Chatsworth in the Valley, uh, where it went uh, three years ago. And um, literally, you have to go out there and see what I keep and what I bring to New York. And, uh, but it, it forced me to do some things, in, including using for the first time fluorescent colors and uh, you know, iridescent colors. Uh, and so, I mean, uh, you, uh, things are progressing. I'm not quite sure how, uh, but things are progressing. And then, as of, uh, what, uh, I guess, five months ago, I uh, got the possibility of a large sculpture commission uh, for uh, Palm Beach, Florida. Uh, and that's going to be a large outdoor sculpture. Uh, and that is going to be not in polyester, which is what I worked in all these years, but in polyurethane, which is a, uh, a plastic and new plastic. It didn't exist when I started working uh, with these pieces. And, uh, but it has the properties of much better weathering in terms of outdoor exposure. And so I just made my first of those pieces, and it's in the show in Orange County, and the second and third are in process right now, and they're going to be shown at the art fair in Miami uh, in December. And uh, so I'm, I'm evolving to a whole new vocabulary, a whole new set of plastic, a whole new set of colors, uh, uh, a whole new way of lighting the sculptures, uh, and hopefully they come out uh, great. I'm sure they will. Yeah, we'll um, see. <laughs> and you were, you, were, you were quite systematic into, in your approach with, with color, right? You, you went through the whole um, color wheel and Yes, like, what we did was, uh, uh, to go through the whole Newtonian color wheel. In other words, uh, the whole spectra of colors uh, that all add up to, if you add them all up, it adds up black. So, uh, and uh, uh, we have made a, a complete set of uh, castings of this, of the order of primary colors uh, they have not been shown yet. They're still in, a, in, a, in crates. And uh, hopefully I'll get an environment sometime soon where I will show that as a, continu a contiguous piece. That, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, Fred, I want to take us back. Let's see if I can find that image. Um, oh, yeah, to this stylish um, guy. And I want to ask you, so you mentioned earlier, you know, your accident and the role it had in, in changing your life from engineer to artist. Can you talk a little bit about the role of being in that environment in Venice? You talk in the movie about, you know, putting your tie and suit in the morning and then coming back at night and being immersed into this artist um, community in Venice. Would, did that have an influence as well? You mean I was still an engineer? Yeah. Um, Yes, in other words, my girlfriend happened to be an artist. Uh, nothing about similar at all to what I'm doing. In fact, nobody, really, I mean, Larry Bell was making, uh, uh, Peter Alexander, but uh, the, um, 
my engineering work, uh, I mean, it was crazy hours, crazy work, being the Russians to the moon. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, seriously, it's a major thing was beating the Russians to the moon. So, I mean, it was, what I worked on for the most part was the last the three years uh, was the high intensity uh, acoustical facilities for NASA Houston to test the Apollo and Gemini capsules, uh, both by themselves and with human people in it, uh, for structural integrity uh, under high vibration and high noise environments be, while it was still on Earth before you put them into space because you want them to at least get good enough to be, you know. So that's what my last job was, and that's what I came back at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning from Houston, uh, having worked uh, four days in a row, just about around the clock on the Apollo and Gemini missions. And uh, that's when I had my accident with my car. My car went start. I tried to push start it, and uh, them there died. And um, uh, I made the transition to engineering. And uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, um, uh, years afterward, I got invited to all the landings uh, up at Edwards Air Force Base. And we went from the hotel, right? a couple of do doors down the street uh, to go to land go to Edwards and watch the landings and meet and eat with the astronauts and such uh, Michael Collins and those people and then I got appointed as the first artist in residence at the National Air and Space Museum so there Michael Collins was the director and I knew him as the astronaut and uh, I spent three years in Washington and ended up uh, in New York, uh, buying a building in New York to cut a relationship. I, I got into a very important relationship uh, with a young woman in Washington who was a major museum person. And uh, to cut a relationship uh, half a year from 3,000 miles to 300 miles. So I bought the building in New York and uh, the relationship fell apart, but I still have the building. <laughs> so it was worth all of it. Um, I want to ask you another question. I want to move on to that picture here. Um, you can go back. I can, yeah. <laughs> that um, is a gentleman, uh, one of the leading doctors of Los Angeles. That picture was taken, I think, yesterday. It was taken yesterday. He's 96 years old. Uh, he is a very famous pediatrician. He took care of virtually everyone's kids, everyone in the art community's kids. Uh, and uh, I had to go by and uh, visit with him yesterday. So that's uh, Leon Banks. The reason, one of the reasons I wanted to ask you um, about this picture is also something you mentioned in the movie, which is how um, you have people collecting you and they're the kids grow up with your pieces and then when they can, um, they buy your pieces. And then you mentioned that Dr. Banks has been collecting your work for decades, right? Yeah, I just, huh. I just wonder, I mean, that's kind of an amazing testament to your work and the kind of artist you are. And I wonder if that's something you ever think about um, in terms of why your pieces um, um, elicit so much love, basically. Yes, but Dr. Banks probably is the largest collector in Los Angeles of uh, David Hockney's work and a major collector of Rauschenberg's work. I mean, he has an incredible collection, one of the better collections in LA. Uh, he's very old now. He can barely walk, unfortunately. Uh, I hadn't seen him in three years. I went over there yesterday. Uh, and, um, uh, but I mean, yes, I mean, I have an awful lot of collectors that uh, from, I've had for 50 years, 45 years, and, uh, and a lot of them have become very close friends. So that's 
you know, it all goes in a, a big circle. And um, uh, the, um, and Jill, is Jill, she's here somewhere, took me over to Dr. Banks yesterday. Uh, and, you know, so it, uh, it's been a very good life. I've, I'm very happy I did what I did. Uh, and um, we'll see what the future brings. Yeah, I think your work is taking on some really exciting new directions. So um, it's going to be amazing to see where it takes you. Um, I think maybe now is a good time to start taking questions from the audience. So um, I, I'm going to check if there is questions from the Zoom audience, but we also have two microphones um, on each side of the room. Uh, please feel free, if you have questions in the room, to come to the microphones. If, the, um, if that's not a good option for you, you can wave and um, someone will, will bring you a microphone. Um, and don't be shy. I know we have questions. Um, I One of the things I see is I see some people from Carnegie Mellon <laughs> that I haven't seen in many years. <laughs> Oh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they really came to, to hear what you, it's your brain that they admire the most. Uh, <laughs> um, no, it's interesting. I mean, I was the first black person to ever live on campus at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, even by the time I graduated, my God, I think I was still the only black person. So uh, uh, it was an interesting four years. And Steve Wiley, my fraternity brother, the ZBT fraternity brother from Carnegie Mellon, showed up with his sister, who I went out with for a little bit in here in California yesterday, at the, or the day before yesterday in Newport for the opening. And so, I mean, uh, that's uh, more than 50 years ago. That's 55 years ago. And Ellen was uh, the woman in the middle, the blonde, uh, one of my uh, people in my car that I always I drove home, drove home. Well, how, how was your experience at Carnegie Mellon overall? Was it like a good experience? Was it? Um, I had a great time, yeah, yes, I yeah. had, a, yeah, 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 I had a great time. Good. Uh, I, uh, I belong to a great fraternity, uh, uh, and I guess so, so lots of friends that I made then that I still have, uh, and uh, I think it's, it was perfect, yes. Going to take the first question from the gentleman over there. He's one of my collectors. <laughs> <laughs> so, Fred, I know. Can you tell us a little bit about the eight-foot piece you did? That was pretty easy, right? You just kind of crank that out. That is in one of the new polyurethane pieces. Okay, I, I mentioned polyurethane. I, mean, oh, the I meant the eight-foot. Yeah, circle you did. The eight-foot piece was uh, for a shopping center in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it was the biggest piece ever made, uh, and it sat in the shopping center for at least 25 years. Uh, I don't know if there's a picture of it in the shopping I don't think I have a picture of the mold. Of the mold, yes. Yeah. Uh, and um, the shopping center was sold, and uh, the piece I'm not sure where it is right now. It was a three color, three layer, correct? Three color, three layer. And it worked on the first try? It worked on the third try. <laughs> <laughs> it worked on the third try. Do you still, did you keep the other two trials? I kept a lot of the pieces. A lot of the pieces ended up being uh, given back to the company I bought the plastic from, Hastings Plastics in Santa Monica and they had it lining the parking lot, and they sold the chunks of it, and that people just carry it away. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask a question from the Zoom audience so that they don't feel left out. Um, someone who's anonymous is asking how much of your work is artistic and how much is scientific? 
it's all artistic. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm attempting to make artistic objects. Uh, I use science as a means of achieving an uh, artistic end. Hi, you have a question over there? Hi, sorry, I'm a lot shorter. Um, I was really interested in um, your experimentation with opaqueness, um, so working with making your materials a little bit more opaque versus transparent, and I was wondering if there was anything in particular that inspired that type of experimentation, <laughs> or, <laughs> or was it just kind of playing around with materials and seeing what happened? No, what really happened was John McCracken, my next door neighbor, uh, who was famous for making black pieces, black planks and such, uh, gave me his can of black pigment and said, I'm tired of making black pieces. I'm gonna make multicolored pieces and I used it to make my first black piece. It sat around for a while because it came out just black, right? No, no. And I had to go to New York. I said to my assistant, you know, if you finish, you know, doing everything else, you can polish the black piece. I got back, he had polished the black piece. It was fantastic. And it sat on the floor of my studio uh, for a couple of weeks, and my secretary at the time, a very famous woman that I hired from the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and then when she left me, she ended up going to a museum in the Midwest as the chief registrar. Uh, she came in, looked at the black piece, and said, Fred, it's the best thing you've ever done why don't you make a white piece for us white people? <laughs> and so I ran to the plastic supply house, <laughs> bought a can of white pigment, and made my first white piece. And then I took half black and half white and made a gray piece. And that started a whole three years of opaque pieces, black, white, and gray. And uh, so that's how it happened. Thank you so much. But you, you mentioned in the movie how the white pieces, um, they do all kind of effects. They're like, they're pearlescent, they're, they're pinkish, they're, you know, milk. Did yeah. you expect that from the opaque pieces? I didn't. I mean, every piece is a, a surprise. If you take white and put a lot of white, you get very white. If you put half as much white, it comes out white, but, you know, with a pink undertone from the resin. And, you know, if you add some black, then it comes, and if you add some transparent, it gets even more complicated. So I've done every combination known to man, I think. I, yeah, I know you have. I'm gonna take a question from Zoom, if you don't mind holding yours. Um, Laurie Finkelstein is asking, where and how do you store your vast collection of artworks that are not sold or shown in a museum gallery? I don't mean a specific address, <laughs> <laughs> which we would not give, presumably. <laughs> but um, storage facilities, warehouse, how do you move your pieces from show to show and back to storage? That's a very specific question. <laughs> yes, I mean, some pieces are in the gallery uh, here in, the, in LA. Some pieces are in the gallery in New York. Some pieces are in storage. And a lot of pieces are in my studio in New York. I have five floors, so I mean, a lot of pieces are in New York. You're very fortunate to live so with your art, because it's just yeah. so gorgeous. Um, all right, Chandler. I noticed some of your pieces are very, most of the pieces are very symmetrical, but some of them are skew. And is that from tilting the spinner? Or how, how does that happen? No, not from tilting the spinner. I mean, and some, I, some pieces I cut after I after I cut them after I cast them, so they're thicker on one end than the other end. So it's, you end up with a balanced piece, with the thicker end at the bottom and the thin end at the top. Have you ever tilted the apparatus to not be level but to be tilted? 
Actually, no. Uh, I haven't. Yes. No, it's something you could do. It doesn't work because as it's liquid. So it'll go like this. Unless the speed is higher. No, no? it doesn't work. You know, I mean, if you think about it, it doesn't work. I thought of it, believe me. <laughs> I, I believe you. <laughs> I, I trust Fred to have done every possible experiment. <laughs> um, but the, these PCs in particular, I've noticed they have a slightly wider, um, the, the bottom is slightly wider, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't be stable. Uh, yes, slightly wider, or no, I mean, sometimes it's, it's identical it's and the it's a little flat, or I use a little thing, little plastic things to keep right. it rolling. Like a mount, yeah. And every piece has a, a natural bottom, no matter what you do, right. whether you like it or not, it's, you know. Um, I want to ask you something you mentioned um, in the movie is very casually, you mentioned that Hastings Plastics um, sold that resin with the name Fred Eversley. Mm. Um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about that? What, what ha yeah. How that I mean, happens? Basically what it is, it's a company called Silmar, S-I-L-M-A-R. Uh, and they, Hastings Plastic bought it from them. And another company called 3M Corporation that made a resin that is, didn't have as nice properties and I didn't use. Uh, other artists used it because it was easier to make a big piece uh, with 3M. So Dwayne Valentine's pieces are 3M. Uh, and um, uh, what was the question? I'm sorry. How did, came to, how did it come to be that they, they marketed that resin as Fred Eversley, or do you remember? Uh, because I got some fame and they decided to... So it was a marketing ploy, essentially. Yes, okay. they decided to, you know. Uh, and when Hastings, Hastings Plastics went out of business in the 80s, uh, and so I have to buy the, the resin directly from the company, the manufacturer of the company. Silmar. Silmar. And uh, they have uh, various distribution. One point is here in California. One is in Farmingdale, New York, at Republic Air Aircraft. Well, my father was president of Republic, I mean, 40 years ago. And so uh, Republic doesn't exist, but the, uh, the facility exists, and it's now my plastic supplies facility. So uh, it's just a pure accident, yes. Um, I have someone from um, in the Zoom who, are, who is asking if we have any example of the black pieces, which, uh, well, I guess. That's a black piece. Um, yeah. On the left is a black piece. Is that an opaque one, or is that a trans translucent one? No, that's transparent. It's transparent. Yes. OK. I mean, and that opaque. That's opaque. That's opaque. OK. Yeah. OK. Um, Linda Bunting is asking who, uh, how often do you refer to your notes and where do you keep them? People are very interested in where you keep things. A little suspicious. What? <laughs> Someone is asking how often do you refer to your notes? You know, your notes, I guess, about casting and, and how much, um, right. you know, catalyst I have, you put. I have a complete notebook of every single thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, and. Luckily, I made a copy of it, and the copy's in, California, in New York. The original, I hope I find on Saturday at, <laughs> at the storage. I haven't been back to the storage since I put it in. I hope the original, but I, I have a, I'm lucky I made a copy. Yeah. And it's every casting I've ever done in my life. Have you gone back to it often, or is you I use it every day? Every day, yeah. But you look at how you made a piece like ten years ago, and does it inform how you make your pieces today? Yeah, I mean, yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, not exactly, but I go and you know, and because I use some new colors and new, you know. But I mean, yes, I I look at it. Right. And. Uh, 
not only for the color, but how much catalyst, mm -hmm. how, how long it takes to harden the, what the, the effect of the ambient temperature on the, the testing time. There's a whole bunch of factors involved. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question over there. Maybe if um, someone can pass a microphone. There's someone who can. Okay, if you project, I can repeat through the microphone. I just wondered, you talked about the um, nation works in Southern California and sort of capturing the energy, the energy I'll repeat the question for the, the people on Zoom. So the question is about how um, the energy here in California um, that you mentioned in the in the movie impacting impacted you and the pieces that you made and how being in New York and having a completely different energy might impact the work that you do now. Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's different, for sure. It's different, uh, but I mean, I try to be n number one. I, there's an enormous amount of experimentation because I'm using new plastics, new everything. New studio. Uh, um, instead of ca I'm casting in my basement, of, you know, in New York, um, uh, different ventilation, different a, a, million, a million factors. Um, but basically, uh, you learn from each casting, and you use the very early castings as some a place to start. But then. It always changes, uh, you know. And as you're doing a casting, uh, uh, you see things that you know aren't going quite right, and you do something, you put a little heat on or something. So I mean, each 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 casting is its own animal. Since we're on the topic of energy, I actually want to ask you. Um, you talk in the movie. Um, about the incredible amount of dog work that is sending your pieces. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that, um, all that love you give your pieces and all the work you put into it to you is palpable in the energy of the pieces, the way they are, the results, if that's something you think. Yes, in other words, uh, uh, the amount of energy you put into sending, and some pieces go easy, some pieces are tougher. Uh, but the amount of energy put in is pretty much reflected in, in the piece, you know? And my assistant, Tony, did an incredible job uh, last week uh, on this major piece uh, that's a 1972 piece. Is there any other question from the audience? Yes. Oh, hey, Brad, good to see you. Hi, how are you? Poly, no, the new pieces that. The, the older pieces you said polyester, and I think you also used the word resin. Uh, yes, resin is the resin, I, and I use the word resin, I'm talking about polyester. Right. Polyurethane? Polyurethane hasn't been around since. From 1990 to the invention of polyurethane later. There's a question. One artist I thought of that might have used plastic was John Art, but I didn't find anything. No, I mean, there's several, many art. I mean, you have Dwayne Valentine, you have Peter Alexander, you have Guy Dill, you have Laddie Dill, you have, uh, uh, there's, uh, particularly in LA. Okay, I'm going to just repeat the question, just to say the question was about uh, what type of plastic artists have used from 1919 to the 60s, and um, Fred, you have an answer to that? I don't know. <laughs> okay, um, it, yeah. <laughs> Aria, you have a question?
but not very much earlier. Yeah, I, I don't want to get too sidetracked into a whole discussion of plastics in art because there have been artists who have used different plastics before polyester was available. Now Gabo um, was an example. There's acrylic, cellulose acetate before, but um, I yeah, think. Yeah, and I, I, I've done a lot of acrylic pieces yeah. as well. So yeah. I mean, uh, I was artist in residence at, for three years at the Smithsonian. I could not do plastic pieces. I could not cast plastic there because of the fumes, fumigate the entire museum. So I was forced to work in acrylic. And in working in acrylic, I started a whole new and metal and plastic. And I started a whole new series of work that for 10 years I did not cast. I, I, I did mostly acrylic and metal pieces for 10 years. And the piece here is a laminated acrylic piece, Fred, right? That's a laminated acrylic piece. Yeah. yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah. Any last question from the audience? And if not, I have one last question from Zoom, um, which is, have you ever done any work with energy and healing or art energy healing? since energy is such a big influence with your work? I mean, by definition, all of my work involves heating. In other words, you add a catalyst which generates heat. Oh, healing, 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 like to healing. Heal. Yeah, healing, like, sorry. Ooh, <laughs> not. I know, that, that was too easy. Ah. <laughs> uh, I don't know, I can't, I mean, I could answer that, but I'm not gonna answer it, it's too difficult. <laughs> I mean, I would argue that your art is healing in itself, maybe. I, in a way, I feel so also, but I mean, that is a whole philosophical discussion that is philosophical more than scientific. But one of your collectors put one next to the couch, you asked him to write. Once again? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, no, I mean, uh, yes, I mean, th there was a, a famous psychiatrist here in Southern California by the name of, Jesus Christ, uh, um, John Atun died in his house. Uh, uh, Judd, yeah, Judd, uh, Dr. Judd, uh, one of the most famous psychiatrists in Beverly Hills. And, uh, uh, he bought a sculpture of mine. I completely almost forgot that. I put it at the end of his couch, literally. And I went into his house at a party, and I snuck around the house looking for where my piece was. <laughs> I couldn't find my piece. And I mean, I didn't go into his medical office, why would I? And, uh, uh, finally, I had to ask him as I left the party where my piece was, and he said, oh, it's in my office. I said, it's in your office, not the house? He said, no, I use it as an object of meditation. And he was probably the most famous psychiatrist in L.A. Uh, at the time. In fact, John Altoon died in his house. And that's the reason I got my studio, because I had John Altoon's studio for 50 years, designed by Frank Gehry, and uh, uh, by Dr. Judd. I completely forgot about that. Dr. Judd had my black sculpture at the end of his couch for people to contemplate. That's amazing. Not the part with John Altoon, but that's, yeah, a beautiful story. I have another question. I just had one more question. A couple of times you touched on working with hazardous materials and the risk associated with that. And I know that a lot of artists face these challenges. And I'm wondering how much of a risk assessment you do when you choose certain materials to work with. 
Like how much does that factor into your work and how much are you willing to sacrifice personally in terms of exposure? You mean in terms of my exposure? Yeah, how much oh, of a- I'm extremely aware of it. Yeah. And I have mask and uh, everything, a special cream on my hands. Uh, uh, I do what I, as much as I can. I ventilate, the, I have big fans blowing through the studio. Uh, I ventilate the best I can. Am I li at risk to someone? Someone, of course I am. It's part of the game. I mean, there's no way you eliminate it exactly because you have to see what you're doing. You have to stick your head in it. And uh, even with the mask on and everything else, you know, who's kidding who? You're gonna get some of it in your lungs. But, you know, somehow I'm 81 and I'm still walking around. <laughs> yeah. uh, I want to read one question from the Zoom audience, if you don't mind. Um, someone is asking if you ever reuse um, discarded materials or, or melt it to reuse it. No. Uh, I mean, you could. Uh, but the, in reality, no, I haven't. I haven't. All right, we're gonna take, that's gonna be the last question. Go ahead. Oh, it's like Columbo. One, one more thing, Fred. Um, I, I wanna ask, about, get us back to process. Um, with your notes that you have that go over these experiments, do you think it's more like a scientific approach that it should in the end belong to all of us to continue the experimentation? Or do you see it more like um, you know, a, a more closed set and that the artists that come afterwards exploring this uh, should, kind of, to say it bluntly, just perform their own experiments with plastics. I don't understand what you're asking exactly. Oh, I'm scared now. Um, <laughs> I, no, I, Fred, I meant that you have your note, uh, your notebook has every, uh, did I hear this right, everyone in the room, that every, yes, you did. every one iteration has been documented. Do you feel like that would belong to kind of all of us? In a, it's a legacy question. Or do you, would you prefer to see future artists who work in plastics perform their own experiments and have their own discoveries? I could care less. And that was. <laughs> that rocks. Thank you, Fred. Whatever. <laughs> Whatever works, works. I don't care how you get there. Yeah. Everybody, on that note, um, first of all, I'm going to invite you, if you want to know more about Fred and his work, please, um, I invite you to consult the book that was just re released by um, David Kordensky called Parab Parabolic Lenses, and you will find some gorgeous images of um, Fred's work as well as um, an interview with him and some inspiring essays. And then I want to thank um, you and also thank Fred very, very much for this conversation. Thank You're you. You're welcome.